not all familiar with her. She's a faculty at CCPPT. So on the occasion of International Women's Day, I salute you. I'm so proud to be here on the panel with um, two generations of uh, um, students who have transformed this campus. And uh, I'm going to step a little away from specific issues so that we can think about what gender justice means. Um, Shweta spoke about workers um, and workers on campus. You see, there's a way in which we think students is one category, workers is one category, feminists is one category, uh, and so on. But actually, there are feminist workers and workers who are on campus. These are not these are not hard boundaries. We are here because there are workers right now working behind us at this time uh, at less than minimum wages. Uh, so these categories are not separate, you know, and, and, and um, bounded categories. We are all, some of us come from working class families, some of us, and so on. So uh, listening to Shweta and um, Albina, there can be no doubt about International Women's Day being a revolutionary occasion. But it has been corporatized at one level. A number of very sweet family members have started wishing me Happy Women's Day, uh, various gentlemen in the family. Uh, very loving, very sweet. But it's seen as a day on which you give women roses, on which you take your girl out to dinner, give your mother a break from the kitchen for that one day, maybe for one hour on that day. Um, so there is a way in which International Women's Day has come to sound like Valentine's Day. But Shweta and Alvina reminded us of its revolutionary history. International Women's Day was established in order to talk about the work that women do, the conditions under which women do that work, and that work is in factories, but also in the home, the unpaid wage labor at home, uh, not wage labor, wage less labor at home. And uh, I like to say that uh, it's not only in tennis, they do it for love at home, but it's not only in tennis that love means nothing. Uh, they do it for nothing, right? That is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> sort of laughing politely. <laughs> this is a real disaster. Anyway, um, so so you have so so I want to talk about from a feminist perspective what gender justice means because gender justice is a feminist term. The idea that you can talk about gender and justice in the same breath comes from feminism. And justice can never mean justice for one section of society. That's not feminism. In the talk that in the talks that both of both Sweta and Albina gave, you saw how different kinds of other kinds of injustice were talked about. Class, to some extent, caste was spoken about, but we need to talk about caste injustice. We need to talk about injustice in terms of ecological uh, devastation. We need to talk about uh, injustice to uh, the Adivasis of any land, the indigenous people of any land. So justice is, for a feminist, justice has many, many, many dimensions. And many of those dimensions, and depending on the issue, some dimensions would be in play, other dimensions may not be in play at that time. Every issue is not about class, caste, environment altogether. But it, depending on the issue, it may be uh, a feminist would have to recognize that gender is secondary in this issue. But just as we would say, an Ambedkarite or a Marxist would have to say class or caste is secondary here, it's gender that's, that's primary here. Whatever that issue is, there would be different kinds of issues. So justice cannot be for one section alone, and that's why, a, you know, a certain kind of feminism, which we could call right-wing feminism, I'm going to just say right-wing feminism because it's a, uh, um, an easy phrase to use, we can unpack it later. So one kind of right-wing feminism would be a 
kind of uh, corporatized uh, liberal feminism in which your concerns are all about women of a certain class, the glass ceiling in, in, in uh, big companies, women becoming CEOs, uh, lean in as uh, there, was a, there was a famous book written by a Google corporate lady, I've forgotten her name, Sandy something. <clears throat> it was called Lean In, which was basically telling women to just step up and be like a boss on the corporate floor. So there's that kind of feminism in which it is all about a particular class of women getting equality with men at that table. That's one kind of right-wing feminism. Another kind of right-wing feminism is the feminism that comes from uh, majoritarian politics. And that kind of majoritarian politics will say, will only notice injustice to women. And we, like, let's talk about India. But we can talk about, you know, a right wing feminism of this kind in the West as well. So let's say in India, injustice to women will only be noticed if the perpetrator is non Hindu. If the perpetrator is non Hindu, ideally Muslim, then the feminism hits the roof. But, it's not about patriarchy, it's not about sexism, it's not about misogyny, because we are talking about things like inter intimate partner violence, which happens across class, caste, community, creed. But that is not the issue for right-wing feminists, because for right-wing feminists, justice is only, again, for a small section of women, provided that those women follow the rules. So even there, it's not as if, if you're identified by them as appropriately Hindu, uh, you, have to, you have to be a particular kind of a woman for them to <coughs> even support you. So right-wing feminism is actually a contradiction in terms. There can be no right-wing feminism because in each of those cases, justice is limited to a small, narrow section uh, and it is it is usually a privilege, either it's majoritarian or in terms of class privilege. Uh, so I would say that that is not even really from the point of view, uh, from the way we speak, that's not really feminism. Because feminism and justice go together in the sense that we, ha we think about justice at many, many, many levels. We recognize that upper caste and, uh, or let's say dominant caste and uh, dominant uh, and upper class women have certain kinds of privileges over men of those groups <clears throat> and so on. We recognize, we recognize the very complicated way in which these power dimensions work <clears throat> such that women are not always the victim. But when we say women are not always the victim, we also see this as <clears throat> um, uh, so yeah, so we, we cannot talk about justice unless we talk about social justice, unless we talk about uh, the uh, need to dismantle, to annihilate, to use Baba Sahib's phrase, to annihilate beyond caste, to annihilate these kinds of hierarchies, these kinds of power relations, these kinds of ways in which uh, people are implicated in privilege, lack of privilege. There are people whose lives will always be uh, on the longest and most difficult track and so on. So when we talk about justice, that justice has to be multidimensional and we have to be alert to which dimension is at play in a particular case. It's not, as I said, that all dimensions are always at play. The second point, uh, of course, is about gender. What is gender justice? So this term gender has come into play again because of feminism, but queer feminism. So we now, uh, by, we now say, if, you know, we recognize that it is not that there are two genders. Uh, we recognize the ways in which men and women are constituted from the moment they are assigned a gender at birth, they are constituted as men or women. And we recognize the power of the queer movement that has challenged it, just as the power of indigenous people's movements and Ambedkarite movements have challenged and forced 
everyone to recognize uh, the, the, that injustice comes in many, at many, many levels. Similarly, the queer movement has forced us to come to, and the movement includes work that is done with scholarship, it comes from science, it comes from philosophy, feminist scientists, feminist historians of science, feminist philosophers of all genders have opened up the idea of gender as one of the identities uh, which uh, is produced historically. The binary sex model has been historically produced. We recognize that gender identities can be fluid and so on, but we also recognize that once you're assigned a gender at birth and you occupy that gender, then you live a very, very different life from someone who has been assigned a different gender at birth. So in other words, the identity, why do, why feminist movement rather than women's movement now? Because it does make a difference once you've been assigned a gender and to, I live in a very different world from my male students. We're not even talking about uh, young women who are much, much more vulnerable than me. Even I don't live in the same world as my male students. Because I, even I, meaning I'm so much older, I have more power than my male students, etc. Nevertheless, if I say wake up at 1 a.m. and say I feel like just going for a walk on the streets, I don't do it. Whereas a young man could do it, and they do it. So we have to recognize that this is a very, this is a kind of a, it's a complicated line that we have to walk as feminists. And I think everyone here is a feminist, is, or has the potential to be a feminist, or maybe already a feminist. I think as feminists, we have to recognize both these things, that gender is fluid, and that gender has been fixed in certain ways through various kinds of discourses. There is a historical moment when that starts happening, and so on. But that doesn't mean that the bodies of people assigned gender female at birth are fluid. We live in a patriarchal, sexist, misogynist society in which to occupy the, the, this body called woman means something. And that is what both Shweta and Alvina were pointing out. It is women who will face sexual harassment from male faculty. And women do face, women students do face sexual harassment from male faculty in this university. They do face it. And we know that, and quid pro quo is a very important uh, idea that feminists have brought into the arena of sexual harassment because there is apparently, sometimes there's apparently consent. Sometimes. Between faculty and students. Because you are scared that if you don't give in, your PhD will be affected. If you're a science student, your research will be affected. So technically there's consent, but there is no real consent and quid pro quo captures that. I give you this, you give me that. So, uh, so the idea of a gender-just campus then, and I'll, I, 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 I'll stop here because I think, I think both, all of well, you might want to talk to all of us and we want to hear you, uh, but the idea of a gender-just com uh, gender campus is, is, a, is an ideal that captures every dream that we have of institutions, functioning institutions building institutions that have been destroyed. There is absolutely no doubt that uh, institutions have been sabotaged, subverted, destroyed. There is no faith, as, as, as Alvina said, you, whether it's ED or CBI or Supreme Court, or any kind of institution, there is such a deep degree of distrust now. And that is the real danger, that we, we, we will lose faith in institutions. We will become cynical. But we cannot afford to become cynical. We have to rebuild institutions. And when we talk about a gender just campus, we are talking about not just a place um, where there's no sexual harassment, which is important, and there should be no sexual harassment, or there should not be impunity for sexual harassment. Sexual harassment should be made accountable. But when we say safety, it's not just uh, it's not only safety of that kind, it's also the safety to speak. 
to speak your mind, how many events have been disrupted on this campus by a certain group of students? How many events? We've never seen this kind of violence on this campus. Now, I mean, every day, every second day, students clash. They've never clashed before. What's the change? What has changed? I think we all know what has changed. Why are there so-called clashes? It's one violent group disrupting a peaceful meeting of some kind. So we're really talking about building up and rebuilding critical thinking. All of this is, is about safety. Safety is not just absence of violence. Safety is not just uh, absence of coercion. Safety is something, something, uh, it, it's something productive, it's something creative. Safety means the, the, the ability to live and think and be whatever you are and that will keep changing. What you are is not something you're born with. What you are will keep changing. So that is safety. That is a gender just campus where an agenda just campus cannot exist in an unjust society. Gender just campus implies our responsibility towards the non-campus, the outside campus, literally the people working just behind the circle of life. Uh, it means that we have a responsibility to something much larger than ourselves because we have been privileged to reach here. We have stepped on many shoulders to reach here. We have walked on many heads to reach here. We have a responsibility to speak up, to be brave. How many students of this university have spoken up and are in jail today for, for, for defending the Constitution? for defending the right to speak up against unjust laws. Students of this university are in jail as we speak, right? So we have to, we have to, we owe them something. We owe them something. We owe them a promise. We owe every struggling person in this country because that is also, a, we've talked about fascists, we've talked about violence, but it is also a fact that I have never seen the degree of resistance to every single one of these things, whether it is to corporate capitalism or whether it is to Hindu Rasht, which will be like, Hindu Rasht is very explicitly about, about uh, 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 delegitimizing you know, a large proportion of the population, including those who don't fit into what Hinduism is supposed to be. Uh, we actually see resistance at every level, whether it is farmers, whether it's indigenous people, and whether it's students. Why are universities the target of struggle? Because uh, the target of attack. Why are universities the target of attack? What is the purpose of the new uh, the NEP, the National Education Policy? What is happening with faculty appointments all over India now? What is the fear? The fear is. Well, there's a code word for it, leftists and feminists. Well, leftists, what, is, what does leftist mean? Feminist, I think, uh, we, by feminist, I think we mean people who believe in gender justice defined in the way that I have defined it. But who are leftists? Leftists are not all members of political parties. You're a leftist if you think about economic justice. And who and anyone, I, I presume all of us think about economic justice, we believe that justice is not uh, simply about being able to go vote once every five years. Justice is not just getting ju justice in court. Justice is economic justice, it's cultural justice, it's gender justice. So, uh, so we really are, uh, we really need to think about a gender justice campus as something that both brings in multiple energies from outside, but also takes these energies outside. That is, you take what you have got here, we owe something to the world outside the campus. And that is the message of International Women's Day. Thank you, Professor Nivedaman. Uh, I mean, we have had three wonderful speakers speaking on different aspects of working towards a gender-just uh, campus. 
A small announcement that I would also want to make is that the uh, presidents of Godavari Hospital and Sabarmati of the okay. gender sensitized.